I'm referring to a kind of experience, a kind of, uh, shall we say, state of consciousness, which seems to be as prevalent among human beings as measles. It's something that simply happens. And we don't know why it happens. And although there are all sorts of techniques which claim to be able to promote it and which are more or less successful in doing so and sometimes rather less than more, nevertheless there is this peculiar thing that happens to people. And it's been recorded as far back in time as we have any recording at all. And that is coming over people the peculiarly convincing sensation that their ordinary sense of individuality, of personal identity, is transcended. And the individual suddenly feels an experience that Actually, it could be described from a number of quite different points of view. But we could add up these dominant characteristics. That instead of the ordinary feeling that I as an individual confront a world that is foreign to me, that is not me, in this kind of experience, I find myself to be of one and the same nature or identity as the world outside me. In other words, I suddenly feel no longer a stranger in the world, but as if the external world were my own body. The next aspect of the feeling is even more difficult to assimilate to our ordinary practical intelligence. But a very overwhelming feeling that everything that happens, everything I have ever done, everything anybody else has ever done, was part of our harmonious design. That there is no error at all. And that's the sort of thing I'm referring to. Now, you see, I'm not talking about a philosophy. I'm not talking about a rationalization, some sort of theory that somebody cooked up in order to explain the world and make it seem a tolerable place to live in. I'm talking about a rather whimsical, unpredictable experience that suddenly hits people. And it includes this element of feeling the total harmoniousness of everything. Now, I realize that those words can carry with them a sort of sentimental feeling, a sort of Pollyanna feeling. There are various religions in our society today which try to inculcate in you the belief that everything is a harmonious unity. You know, things like Christian science or the unity movement and so on. They want to, to make a kind of propaganda for one to believe and through believing to feel that everything is harmonious. Now, to my mind, that is a kind of pseudo-mysticism because it's an attempt to make the tail wag the dog. To make the... The, con the, the, the effect produced the cause. Because this sensation of things being harmonious is somehow never brought about by insisting to yourself that that is so. Because when you do that, when you would say to yourself, uh, all things are light, all things are God, all things are beautiful, etc. Actually, by doing that, you're implying that they're not. Because you wouldn't be saying all this stuff uh, if you really knew it to be true. A 
so this thing the, the sensation of a kind of universal harmony cannot come to us when it is sought when we look for it as something to be an escape from the way we actually feel or to compensate for the way we actually feel it's a thing that comes out of the blue and when it comes out of the blue just like hiccups come out of the blue or something like that it's overwhelmingly convincing and it, it stands as actually the foundation for most of mankind's profound philosophical, mystical, metaphysical and religious ideas. Someone, in other words, to whom this sort of thing has happened. And as I said before, it strikes us as measles may strike us. Someone to whom this sort of thing has happened can't restrain himself when it has happened and he has to get up and tell everybody about it. And alas, he becomes the founder of a religion. Because people say, look at that man, how happy he is. What conviction he has. He has no doubts. He seems to be sure in everything he does. You see, that's a wonderful thing about a great human being. He's like an animal or a flower. See, when a flower buds and the bud goes pop and opens, it has no hesitation or doubts about it. But when a young woman appears in society as a debutante, you know, she's not quite sure if she's going to come off. And uh, she appears on the stage of society with some doubts in her mind. And therefore, all appearances of this kind are a rather sickly nature. <laughs> but when the bird sings, or the chicken's egg breaks, <coughs> the flower buds, there's no doubt about it at all, comes forth. <coughs> And so in the same way when somebody has an experience of this kind, he just has to tell everybody about it. Because you see, he sees everybody around him looking dreadfully serious. Looking as if they had a problem. Looking as if the, the act of living were extremely difficult. But from his standpoint, the person who's had this experience, he feels that they look funny, that they don't understand, that they, there isn't any problem at all. That he has seen from where he stands, you see, that the meaning of being alive is just being alive. That is to say, I look at the color of your hair and the shape of your eyebrow and I understand that that is the point. That's what we're all here for. And it's so plain, and it's so obvious, and so simple. And yet here is everybody rushing around in a great panic, as if it were necessary for them to achieve something beyond all that. And the funny thing is, they're not quite sure what it is. But they are devilishly intent upon it. After that thing. <clears throat> and so, to the person in the state of consciousness, which I call mystical, that all seems very weird, very absurd. But it's not something that you criticize in an unkindly way. You don't say, those damn fools those idiots, you say, it's such a pity that they don't see it. Because although they are going around in this wildly ignorant pursuit, one of the funny things about it is that they don't realize that there is a dimension, a sense in which their pursuit is magnificent. It's an, to give an obverse sense to the saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Turn that into its opposite. Uh, not forgive them, but give them a blessing, because they don't know what they do. Give them an honor. In other words, 
the intensely serious preoccupations and anxieties of mankind appear from this standpoint not to be foolishness but to be a kind of marvel in the same way perhaps as you could say that the protective coloring of a butterfly who has somehow contrived to make its wings look like enormous eyes so that when a bird who is about to devour this beast is confronted by these staring eyes the bird is a little hesitating as when you stare at somebody they're always taken a little bit aback and so the butterfly appears to stare at the bird and perhaps you see this phenomenon of the marvelous staring wings of the butterfly is in some way a result of anxiety the anxiety to survive all the problems and struggles of natural selection nevertheless in this intense struggle we are unknowing poets You see, one of the greatest ideas in the world that has ever been produced is, for my thinking, the Hindu idea that the world is a drama in which the central and supreme self behind all existence gets lost and involved and pretends plays that he or it or he she or whatever you want to call it is all the creatures that there are and gets totally involved and thus you see the more involved the more anxious the more finite the more limited the infinite manages to feel itself to be the greater the artistry the greater the depth of the illusion which is created for you see all art is in a way illusion the art of the magician is the art of illusion, the art of misdirecting attention so that a magic seems to appear. And so in this way, the more there is anxiety, the more there is uncertainty, To that degree, the play has succeeded in the same way as when you are watching an actual play or reading a novel or a movie, the more the author or the actors manage to grip you and to persuade you just for a moment that you are actually involved in reality, the more they have succeeded as artists. You may have a faint recognition in the back of your mind that this is after all only a play. When you sit on the edge of your seat and you're sweating and your hands clutch the arms of the chair and the scene so grips you, that is magnificent acting. And so the Hindus feel that the whole arrangement of the cosmos is something exactly like that. But when in the reality of actual life you are sweating it out and you're wondering whether this surgeon who's got to operate on you in a matter of life and death is a competent man or a charlatan. Or whether the investment that you made is a good thing or whether it's going to make you lose your shirt. You see, all those matters of terrific crisis are exactly the same as when you're sitting in the theater, sweating it out there. But now a far more convincing theater has been arranged. Because, as the Hindus would say, that in you which is it, 
the basis of you, the thing that is real in you and that connects you under the surface with every other being that is alive. This is the player of the parts. This is the maker of the illusion. This is the player of the game which has got you involved in this mess and is living it up in the same way as those actors on the stage are living it up to convince you that this is a real situation. And this is very understandable because basically everybody loves to play this game. The game of hide and seek. The game of scaring oneself. Uh, running up behind yourself in the dark and saying, BOOM! All children like to do this. And this is the most human thing that's why we go to the play, to the movie, and why we read novels. And our so-called real life is from the position of the mystic an extension of the same thing. Because you see, he is the person who suddenly has realized that the game is a game. And that behind all you see, if the game is hide and seek, or if the game is lost and found, everything to do with the hide side, side or the lost side is connected with where we as individuals feel lonely, impotent, put down, and so on. All the, the negative side of existence. I have tried to show you at various times that there's really one simple principle that underlies everything and it's so simple it's funny. The principle is all insides have outsides. Because you see you don't know that the inside is inside unless there's an outside and you don't know that the outside is outside unless there's an inside. Okay, <coughs> then you as you ordinarily feel yourself are the inside. <coughs> You are the animate, sensitive being inside the skin. But the inside of the skin goes with the outside of the skin. If there weren't the outside of the skin, there wouldn't be no inside. And the outside of the skin is the whole darn cosmos. Galaxy beyond galaxy and everything, you see? And that goes with the outside. In the same way that front goes with back. So that if you wake up and understand that, you find that the two are one and the same identity, one and the same self, one and the same life. So that's the mystic's point of view. He finds that out. Now if I may switch, what is morals? In the sense in which I am using the term morality, or morals, it's a set of rules analogous to the rules of language. Now it's perfectly obvious, isn't it, that we can talk to each other in English only if there is mutual agreement among ourselves as to how to use the language. What words refer to what experiences and what ways of stringing words together to be meaningful are to be used. And it's very much of interest that we don't have too much trouble in coming to this agreement about language. We don't find 